But uh, so in 1968, this guy named Dave King, who was working with Winks, yeah. hired me to uh, do the weekends up at WSID FM in Baltimore, which later became WLPL. Mm -hmm. and, but it was it was all underground music based on what the New York stations were doing at that period of time, mm -hmm. and WBZ in Boston was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, you know, flower power, uh, psychedelic rock right. kind of things. And I did 6 to midnight on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. And I didn't drive I didn't drive until I got out of the Army. So I had to take a bus from College Park up to the station, which was on 4340 Park Heights Avenue in Reisterstown, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Take the bus up there from College Park. It took like an hour and a half. Walk down the street to the station. Hang around all afternoon. Do my show stay overnight at the station mm -hmm. stay there all day on Sunday do my show 6 to midnight on Sunday then go to back down to downtown Baltimore catch the bus back to College Park and get in around 5 or 6 in the morning ostensibly to go to classes which I didn't, didn't bother doing so so I worked there for about a year and a half I know I was working there when uh, Otis Redding was killed and I was working there uh, when uh, Bobby Kennedy was killed was there any uh, sort of underground type stuff that you were, I mean, like the real underground stuff, or was the MC5 coming across your radar at that point, or were the that's, seeds? Or that, that's a little earlier, MC5. We, we would have been playing the seeds. Uh, but it was, it was you know, things that, uh, like Circus Maximus, The Wind, uh, things like that. Cool. A lot of vanilla fudge. I mean, this is still a year or two away from Led Zeppelin, things of that nature. So the question about Led Zeppelin is, did they play Wheaton, Maryland? Yes, they did. Were you at the they, show, No, case? no, my friend Mark Weiss was there. They played as the New Yardbirds. They had some contracts that they had to fulfill gotcha. from gigs that they had uh, missed as the Yardbirds. And, so uh, uh, how come those guys aren't ever going to catch up with Mark and uh, just confirm that, that he was at the concert? Because everybody's saying we can't uh, find uh, him. It's, it's confirmed. There, there's at least 10 people I know that were there. Gotcha. Now, um, so after Winks, what was the next uh, station that you went on to? Well, no, the, the, uh, the one in Baltimore was the first professional station I worked at. Then, because I had done well there, Bob Edson at Winks, who was the program director, he hired me okay. to do weekends there, which I did right. up until the time I went in the Army. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I moved back up okay. to Walter Reed, while I was still in the Army, I went back to doing weekends at Winks. Okay. And, I, and I, when I came out, then I became program director and music director and uh, full-time announcer there. And how long was your stay at Winks? Well, I was there in 69, Initially. 70, 71, 72. 73, part of 74, and then I went back in 76 after I stopped working for RCA Records okay. and worked there until early 77 when I opened up Hit and Run with Albert Galani. Did you go up to New York when you were with RCA? Or? Well, only for conventions and things. Like that's where they hired people out of. What, did you, what were, you, were you doing specifically? I was a Midwest promotion manager. I covered all of Kansas, Just going all, over the all place. of Missouri, and half of uh, Illinois. When the artists would come to town, I'd take them around to the radio stations. I see. Um, Who were some of the artists that they had you uh, doing the promo work with? Uh, Jefferson Starship, uh, a lot of the country artists. St. Louis was a, which was where I was based out of. Mm -hmm. Met a lot of the country people. I got pictures of me and Waylon Jennings, John Denver. I met uh, when he was there. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Stewart, uh, Johnny Russell, who wrote "Act Naturally." They all came through uh, that town while I was there. And then uh, you came back to D.C. and worked at Winks again. Uh, yeah, for a very brief period of time, but that was right at the the beginning of the disco period and uh, current music sucked which is really the only reason that uh, New Wave was able to gain such a foothold and uh, it's one of the reasons why I left it and run at, shortly after Alan and I had started it because mm -hmm. we originally intended it to be a collector's shop mm -hmm. and deal with people who wanted old Beatles and Rolling Stones, Yardbirds, right. things of that nature from the 60s with picture sleeves but there was such a buzz starting with all the things from England and from the West Coast and from New York City yeah. that I was more into that stuff. Mm -hmm. It just interested me more in terms of the different labels and the, the uh, artists and the pictures. Of these. And Al was still wanting to do more of the digital thing. Although after I left and started my own store, yeah. he got into that as well, more so than he had been. So. And where was this store located? Or well, that store? store was in Kensington. Okay. Uh, and, and you immediately went to Rockville Pike, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the first... Uh, I started with just the one shop, and then, as you know, we expanded to two shops yeah. in 1980, uh -huh. side by side. And for a very brief period of time, I had a, a store in Virginia as well, uh, right around 1980. Where was that at? I don't know. Okay. It was in somewhere in Arlington. Gotcha. Um, a woman named Susan Marquis, who was in a band called Citizen 23 that I produced, who became the Velvet Monkeys. Yeah, yeah. She uh, was working at the store, but 
she lived in Virginia, so uh, she suggested we open up a store over there to compete with Bill Ass, but uh, he wasn't too happy about it. And the store was broken into a couple times, so after about three months, I closed it down. Gotcha. And uh, moved everybody back to uh, the Rockville store. So um, Bill Ass was pretty much your first competitor in terms of uh, a record store getting into some punk stuff, as well as also being a bit of a uh, impresario himself with uh, releases and such? Well, I would say certainly from that standpoint, because he had his own bands, that he was working with like True Facts and Insane Acts and the Insect Servers. Uh, but at the same, same time, we were putting a lot of things out at Limp that maybe really didn't have anything to do with the record store itself. Mm -hmm. It was just an avenue. Uh, but Al was still carrying a lot of the imports and punk stuff. And some of the stores down in Georgetown were starting to have individual people who worked there who were into that as well. And mm -hmm. they would get in for a period of time when Peaches was around uh, over on Nicholson Lane in Rockville. They had people who were into that uh, music, so they were focusing on it as well. So there was no real one store like a Bleaker Bob's in New York City where everybody would point to that and say, okay, well, that's where it all started. Right. I um, mean, we were very fortunate to be in a place where we were at the time and have the connections with the groups and artists because a lot of them shopped at the store that it ended up because of my previous experience working in the record industry and producing records. Uh, I had worked with Pentagram earlier in the 70s mm -hmm. when I was still on radio. So... I was able to work around in a studio with these groups and help them get the sounds that they wanted to get right. so the records didn't just sound like rehearsal tapes. So uh, might as well touch on the pentagram. So how did you run into those guys? I did a show on Winx in the uh, 72 period of time called Heavy Metal Thunder, okay. uh, playing Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Sir Lord Baltimore, mm -hmm. those kind of things. So it ran at night. I, I did the show from 6 to 10 at night, and uh, we got really great ratings uh, for that show. And they were living over in Virginia. Mm -hmm. They were all suburban Virginia guys, and they loved the show. And uh, eventually, I met up with them, started trading them records and things that they were looking for. And uh, they gave me a demo tape. And this first 45, they did the Macabre 45, mm -hmm. which is was terrible. A song called Before Warned. It was just produced really horribly. Probably worth like a thousand dollars. No, no. Something. They actually, when they did the reissues of their stuff a couple of years ago, they did a repressing of the 45 and put it along with the album. But. Um, I took him in a bias recording studio over in Virginia, mm -hmm. worked with the engineer Bill McElroy over there, and uh, produced a five-song demo tape, which we sent around to the record companies. But it was a finished tape, mm -hmm. and all those songs ended up on uh, one of the releases they did two years ago. Gotcha. And uh, then later that same year, we went and recorded the 45 on Bafo Sacco, uh, Earth Flight and Hurricane, which I produced as well. And then the following year, when Randy Palmer joined the group as mm -hmm. a second guitarist, we went into track studios and cut under my thumb because at that point in time, uh, top 40 stations were playing things like Kissing Time by Kiss and Locomotion by Grand Funk Railroad. Right. They were heavy metal top 40 remakes of uh, songs that were popular. So they wanted to do under my thumb and try and get in with that kind of sound, even though it was really not a pentagram sound. They made it a pentagram sound with that thing. Did you do make any efforts to sort of try to shop those guys around? Because I know they did come across... No, that wasn't, that that wasn't my job. It, it, the, I was not involved with them in management at all. Uh, Bobby was a pain in the butt to deal with, and right. uh, I was friends with Jeff, the drummer, but uh, the rest of the guys in band, uh, Vincent, uh, the guitarist, and Greg Main, the bassist, uh, uh, I was friends with and, and Randy you know bought records from me as well he was hanging around with the band before he joined the band mm -hmm. but uh, they had management uh, at that time Steve Lorber and Gordon Fletcher managed them later on and uh, I, I had nothing to do with them other than trying to get them a deal by sending these tapes around gotcha so um, when did the uh, whole punk rock new wave thing come across your radar uh, in terms of uh, the music, or in terms just, of the just records, the, just the music, just the music itself. Like, did you, were you reading about it in the press, or did someone come to you and say, "Hey, man, you got to check out this Ramones record," or "Hey, man, I just got the Sex Pistols record." How did that? Well, I think that definitely when we were, we were still at Hit and Run, when a lot of that stuff, the early Clash stuff, and the first Sex Pistols 45 were coming out of that period of time. I think that we missed the first Sex Pistols 45. Uh -huh. uh, I think God Save the Queen and Pretty Vagrant were the first ones we carried over there, and by the time I started up yesterday and today, Sex Pistols were already pretty much finished with. They were just right. putting out the material they had done with Great Rock and Old Flying Swindle after that. And, yeah. yeah. Um, but the early New York City things and subsequently the early L.A. things were things that uh, became very popular. And one thing you have to understand is that at that point in time, there were no young kids that were into punk rock. Right. These were all people who were disenfranchised, middle adults, middle-aged uh, gotcha. professional people. Right. They went to the clubs, went to the record stores. 